The meeting is about to be called back to order, is being called back to order. The next item on the agenda is a public hearing on the backfilling of trenches. Would Councillor McLaughlin from the Ordinance Committee like to give us background? Once again, I ask those not here for other items on the agenda to please clear the hall if you want to have a conversation. Council McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, on the proposed amendment to the Town Ways Ordinance, Chapter 17, Section 17-3-6, We've had a request from Robert Malley, the Public Works Director, regarding the section that regulates the backfilling of trenches. Um, primarily the concern is that trenches were not being cold patched after they were backfilled. The ordinance language as proposed would have that happen within 24 hours after the trench had been backfilled. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this item? Other questions from the councillors on this particular item? Councillor Pearson, Pearson. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman, uh, I just had one, one thought here, uh, if it could be added, and I don't know if it's too much wording or whatever, but that this, within 24 hours after the trench had been backfilled, uh, regardless of whether that 24 hours falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or holiday, unless the trenching has resulted due to an emergency and patch is not available. Because I think that that way, contractors would be a little bit more aware instead of saying, oh, gee, we dug the trench on a Friday. We can't get it Saturday. I mean, that still leaves it 24 hours open. I don't know if that's possible to say. I mean, if they're doing work that's planned, they've got to know in advance that they have to have the cold patch. Yeah, I so I don't, it's I don't Mr. Malley. know yeah, the intent was that it would be a 24-hour period, whether it be a Saturday or a Sunday okay. or a holiday, because if they did do the trench work on, say, a late Friday afternoon, that trench could technically sit all weekend long and not yeah. be cold patched. Mm -hmm. And it may be on a busy road where it could cause a traffic hazard. So yeah. the idea was if they had to do it on a Saturday, they had to do it on a Saturday. No, that's, and that's what I wanted to make clear to them, saying, you know, unless, of course, it's an emergency. I mean, if someone has a ruptured pipe and coal patch is not available. Right. You know, I don't know if that should be added in there. Do you feel that it's clear enough in your mind, and if anyone asks you that you have it stated yeah, clearly enough for you to enforce it? Yeah, the question comes into emergency. One person's definition of an emergency may be different from another. And I think this, the idea behind this was to give it a clear-cut decision on it, that it had to be done. Okay. And I think if you it. leave a little gray area there, could be uh, open to an interpretation okay. of somebody. And just, just a question. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Manager McGovern. Just going to say, anyone who opens a road in Cape Elizabeth should know that they need to get coal patch beforehand anyway. And most contractors would keep it uh, stockpiled. And what we do when someone does take out a street opening permit, we give them a copy of the Townways Ordinance mm -hmm. so they know what the regulations they have to adhere to. So it's not a surprise to them after they do the work. Is there anyone else from the public who wishes to make a comment on this ordinance change? If not, I'll close the public part of the hearing and we'll go on to item number 41 to consider a proposed amendment to the town ways ordinance regarding the backfilling of trenches within town ways and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin. Madam Chairman, I wanted to add one other revision within this proposed language. There apparently had been a word missing in the former edition. It now says that fine material, free of lumps and stones, no larger than three inches, shall be thoroughly compact around and under the substructure to the upper level of the substructure. The word no had been missing before, so the stone size is very explicit now. And I would like to move that we adopt the proposed amendment to the Townways Ordinance, Chapter 17, Section 17-3-6, as presented this evening. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Next item on the agenda, a public hearing on Shore Road parking near Fort Williams. Council McLaughlin, would you like to give us some background on that? Thank you, Madam Chairman. As we discussed last month, there had been brought to the town's attention from a citizen living in the 
vicinity of Fort Williams, the problem that the town was quite well aware of, I believe, with traffic and parked cars in that area, especially during special events held at the fort. The proposal is to prohibit parking on both sides of Shore Road from the Chapel Road entrance of Fort Williams on the northern side down to Dyer Pond Road on the southern end of the fort. Um, and I think that this apparently is to call into place a total of six signs as is presented in the manager's memo to us this evening. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to make a comment? There being no comments, I'll close the public part of the hearing and we'll move on to item number 42 to consider a proposed amendment to traffic schedule regarding parking on Shore Road near Fort Williams Park and take any necessary action. Do I have a motion? Madam Chairman. Council McLaughlin. I move that we adopt the proposed amendment to the parking regulations, section 13-2-2, sub Q12. Reads, no parking at any time on either side of Shore Road from the Chapel Road entrance of Fort Williams Park to Dyer Pond Road. Second. Any discussion? There being no discussion, all those in favor of the motion? It's a 7-0. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda, public hearing for Great Bay Hotels, doing business as in, have I skipped something? I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Public hearing on dead end roads. <coughs> Council McLaughlin. I'm catching up with you. <laughs> um, these are proposed, proposed revision to ordinance section 16-3-2 sub A sub 9 of the subdivision regulations regarding short, you know, regarding sub dead end streets. I'm still on Shore Road, which is not a dead end street. Um, the ordinance committee has discussed this in a couple of their meetings. It was set to public hearing last month, at last month's meeting. Since that time, there has been a memorandum um, presented from the Cape Elizabeth Police Department that um, apparently represents the views of the police department, the fire department, and the public works director. I would recommend that if anybody from the public is here this evening to speak to this, we certainly have their input. And I think I can speak with the ordinance committee and say we would like this to come back to the ordinance committee so we can take another look at it. Is there anyone here from the public who wishes to make a statement in reference to this ordinance change? There being none, I'll close the public part of the hearing. Councilor, discussion or comments? Councilor Jordan. I understand from Council McLaughlin that uh, this is going back to the Ordinance Committee. She would like to see it go back to the Ordinance Committee. That she would like to see it go back to the Ordinance Committee, yes. I'll make a motion that this is referred back to the Ordinance Committee for review. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please 7-0. And now we'll move on to our last public hearing. The Great Bay Hotels Incorporated doing business as in by the sea for a full-time malt, spiritus, and vinous license. Is there someone for the public who wishes to make a comment? Would someone from the um, in by the sea like to make a comment? Presentation. Madam Chairman, my name is Peter Reisman. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, we don't have a presentation to make. I think uh, the application speaks for itself. We've obviously had a license for several years now, but I would be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. And also, John and Larry Cowden, who are the innkeepers, are here tonight. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to make a statement? There being none, I'll close the public hearing and we'll move on to night item 44. 44. Um, to consider granting a full time malt spiritus Venice uh, license to Great Bay Hotels doing businesses in by the sea and take any necessary action. 
discussion or comments from councillors? Councillor Creelman. Yes, um, Mr. Reisman. When we received our packet for this town council meeting, it was brought to our attention that the Inn by the Sea currently, at least from our records, owes slightly over $100,000 in past due personal and real estate property taxes. I am aware that there was this very day received in town hall a check for $30,754.41. And I was delighted to see that at the uh, onset of our council meeting this evening. I guess what both concerns me and confuses me is that we um, had our town assessor um, recently reassess the, the property, which brought the tax liability lower uh, for the current fiscal year than it had been in the prior two fiscal years since the uh, inn was built. Uh, the Inn's a delightful and gorgeous looking uh, structure. Uh, we're all very uh, proud of it and happy it is in Cape Elizabeth. I'm just, again, confused about the circumstances of the alleged in arrears. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I'm concerned when any taxpayer owes this kind of money um, and it seems to me that we have a couple of different issues surrounding this, uh, this money. One is the hope that our town assessor is going to make his uh, reassessment retroactive. And I'm not clear, and maybe I need help from the town manager as to, as to what the status is of this issue, because it, it appears from the material we received this evening that of the $30,000 that was given to us today, um, there still has been nothing paid on the 1989 assessed um, sum as I look through the areas that have been paid for uh, 1990, both uh, interest and principal. Where are we for 19? 89, either Mr. Uh, Reisman or uh, Mr. Manager, because <coughs> I'd like to get this uh, resolved. Well, we would too, Mr. Krillman. Um, I'm glad to address these issues, and I'm, I think it's a good time to do it. I'm sure you understand that this has nothing to do with the liquor license, it's, but since we're here now, we might as well talk about it. Um, we paid the first half FY90 taxes today. Um, the inn is a seasonal business, as I indicated in my letter to the town council. I don't know if Mike's given you a copy yet, because he just got it a little while ago. You do have a copy. We'll probably always pay our taxes in the late summer, early fall, and we'll pay the interest charge that goes with it, because that's what our cash flow is. Uh, we intentionally did not pay anything on the FY89 taxes. That's not a position we can maintain too long, Mr. Creelman. Come February, if we haven't paid it, you own the inn for a song, and I don't think we're going to allow that to happen. Um, it's more of a symbolic gesture than anything else. We do feel that uh, the inn was overtaxed in FY88 and FY89. Um, as I indicated in my letter, the taxes are supposed to be based on um, a combination of both replacement cost and income stream, um, the value of the income stream. That's a relatively new concept in municipal taxation. It came out of a, a state Supreme Court case, I believe, in 1988 regarding apartments in South Portland, um, where the uh, up until then, municipal assessors had always gone on replacement cost only. Um, so, and the, the law court came down and said, no, you, know, you shouldn't do that. This is commercial property. You've got to consider the uh, income stream value. So that's 
caused a number of reassessments and reconsiderations. Um, anyway, we're saying that we feel that the uh, FY88 and 89 taxes were unfairly high and that the um, reassessment that Mr. Daigle approved for FY90 should be carried back to FY88 and FY89. Um, we fully realize that um, if the council is sympathetic to this request, the um, council will most likely ask Mr. Daigle to investigate it, and Mr. Daigle will ask me to produce certain financial records and so forth. So this is not a yes, no issue, and I imagine the council would then ask Mr. Daigle to make his recommendation to the council. Yeah, I'm sorry to sort of interrupt you, Mr. Reisman, but we are getting off track. Um, the issue before us tonight is whether or not to re renew your liquor license. Correct. And as curious as we all are about the tax situation, um, the taxes really, whether paid or not, do not have a direct, direct relationship into whether or not we should grant your license. Correct. So I think perhaps we best reserve the tax issue for another forum and um, continue with the item before us, which is the um, renewal of your of your license. And I do want to ask Mrs. Pizzo if she feels that everything has, is complete, if the application is complete. Yes, <coughs> Councilor Jordan. Madam Chairman, I move that we grant the license. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Madam Chairman. Councilor McLaughlin. When I was reading through the application, I see on the second page down near the bottom above the bold print that it authorizes whoever this is directed to to obtain and examine all books, records, and tax returns pertaining to the business. I know I've continually heard that the property tax issue is separate from the liquor license issue, but I've heard from a number of constituents saying that they have a hard time understanding how and why it is separate. I'm having a hard time understanding it with this kind of language on the application form. I don't know really how to interpret that if it does give some standing to the thought that an outstanding property tax bill can, does influence issuance of a can, can liquor license. I don't know if uh, Mr. McGovern has any. Can you or Mrs. clarify Pisa, that, Mr. McGovern? That? Oh, Mrs. Pisa. Yes, the, uh, the next to last page of the application provides the criteria that the uh, municipal offices uh, shall utilize in the state statute for the review of uh, licenses such as this. Uh, specific, specifically, and I'll read it. In granting or denying an application, the municipal offices or the county commissioner shall indicate the reasons for the decision and provide a copy of the applicant. A license may be denied on one or more of the following grounds. A, conviction of the applicant of any class A, B, or C, or class C crime. B, non-compliance with the license premises or reduced from any local zoning ordinance or other land use ordinance not directly related to liquor control. C, conditions of record such as waste disposal violations, health and safety violations, or repeated parking or traffic violations on or in the vicinity of license premises and, and caused by persons patronizing or employed by the licensed premises or other such conditions caused by persons patronizing or employed by the licensed premises which unreasonably disturb, interfere with, or affect the ability of persons or businesses residing or located in the vicinity of the licensed premises to use their property in a reasonable manner. Obviously written by a legislature. <laughs> uh, D, repeated incidents uh, of record of breaches of the peace, disorderly conduct, vandalism, or other violations of law on or in the vicinity of the licensed premises and caused by person patronizing or employed by the licensed premises and E, a violation of any provision of this title. Those are the, uh, okay. the uh, grounds for denial of the state of the Kramer. Madam Chairman, I'm, I'm always willing to yield to the chair uh, <laughs> on these kinds of issues, but I, I too, with uh, Councillor McLaughlin, read over the issue of records and tax returns pertaining to the business and I read that in the context of the, the town manager indicating um, on our agenda that, uh, that this was an annual license renewal, but coupled with that was the in does owe slightly over $100,000 in past due personal and real estate property taxes. Now, 
maybe it's just unfortunate that this evening is the first time that we as a, a council have had the opportunity to see exactly what is in question. But at the same time, um, you know, unless this is in a formal process of, uh, you know, going through a uh, request either through the town assessor or whether it's going to come to us, I'd like to get this resolved if it's been dragging around uh, since 1989. And I agree from what we've spoken about already, I do not have any problems with any of the criteria for findings uh, to not grant the in uh, by the sea their liquor license. I just want to simply clarify uh, this confusion and wrap it up so that we don't run into this next year as we ran into it last year. Officer um, Tolan is here. Um, since have there been any Captain. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to have to owe you a letter of apology tonight. I've really done awful things. But anyway, between his title I, and his name, you have an awful title. I'll come in next time. <laughs> yes. um, can you tell me if the police department has um, any records of um, disorderly conduct or other complaints, breaches of peace, that would be appropriate for denying this license? None. In fact, they're very quick to call if there's problems on the grounds that have nothing to do with guests at the hotel. Thank you. Is is this tax, are these tax records that they make reference to, Mr. Um, McGovern, possibly not just um, taxes as far as property, but also federal alcohol tax? Yeah, I, I think one and issue income that, that would need to be clarified with this particular paragraph is whether or not it pertains to the Bureau of Alcohol and Beverages Licensing Division and whether or not that also extends to the town. And that's something that you know, I would want to consult with uh, legal counsel to see if, in fact, it pertains to the municipal office as well. I get much sure that it does. Because this is actually an application to the Bureau of Alcohol and Beverages if the, the municipal office is something in here. Councilman McLaughlin. I am aware that there is a motion on the floor. I would propose that if that motion is defeated, I would be prepared to make a motion that we table this item until our September meeting, which is September 10th. Your current, ish, your current license expires September 11th. If there were that successful tabling motion, I would feel a lot more comfortable in responding to the citizens of this town if the town received additional payment on the property taxes prior to September 10th. Councilor Amaro. Uh, if Councilor McLaughlin's suggestion uh, uh, was actually uh, enacted, it would give the manager a chance this month to also check on that language to see what its application is to the municipality. So I think it's a good suggestion. Councilor Jordan, you were the originator of the motion. What do you want me to do with it? Well, I'm just asking you if you want to modify it or do we move it? Okay, uh, take a vote. No, we, we can take a vote on it. You can do it two ways. You can take a vote on it or I can withdraw it if I get the second to withdraw the second. And, but Let's I am confused as whether the manager is going to be able to get this legal business cleared up within a month. You say yes? My, my first route would be to call the Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages in Augusta to see what, what their impression of it is. Beyond that, I would check with the Maine Municipal Association's legal counsel. Uh, and I would anticipate uh, to get it cleared up. Yes. And would you, would you communicate with the by the sea of what you find out? Or do we come back at the next meeting and drop it on them then? That's if that is the desire of the council, yes. That's my desire. I don't know if it's the desire of the council or not. So okay. I'll... If the second one will draw it and make it easier for you, I will withdraw the motion. Madam Chairman, I will withdraw my second. I okay. will withdraw the motion. Is there another motion? Council McLaughlin. Madam Chairman, I move that we table this item to the town council meeting of September 10th, 1990. Second. Those in favor? 7-0.
this item has been tabled until our next meeting with direction to the manager to consult with the Bureau of Alcoholic <coughs> Beverages Licensing Division and the Municipal Association Legal Council and forward their decisions, their comments to Mr. Reisman and the invited Another point of clarification. If, if in fact it is found that, that those are available, I assume, unless I get to the contrary, do you, you want them requested? The documents contained listed in that paragraph. Run the bunny again. I lost it. Uh, you asked me to, uh, to find out if this paragraph that said you authorized to obtain and examine all books, records, and tax returns pertaining to the business which is liquor license requested and also said books, records, and returns during the year in which any liquor license is in effect. If, in fact, the Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages and uh, the attorneys state that that does apply to municipal offices, uh, I assume you also wish me to request that information from uh, Great Bay Hotels Incorporated. No, I, I don't think that I need to see them. I think if you as a manager in the town attorney reviewed them, that would be satisfactory to me. I don't think you should slide them all around the municipal office. I think that should be only in direct reference whether or not the municipality has um, the right to obtain those records for property tax payment purposes. You don't want to go beyond that? No. We're not really... No. That, it seems to be the only interest in the council and not all the other records. Council, <coughs> and, uh, did you have and uh, am I correct in saying that we do not need to have a second public hearing next month on this item since we've already had the public hearing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we'll go on to item. Do you want to hear them from the, those people? Oh, I'm again? sorry. Mr. Reisman. I haven't quite known what to make of all this because you already have our financial records. You've had them for several months, all of them. Sure you have. Gave them to Mr. Daigle. No. I, I, you don't know. Well, I feel a little awkward. The items already been voted upon. Do you want them to respond? You do. Do you have them or don't you have them? Mr. Daigle was given certain records for assessment pur purposes. Uh, only he has inspected them, and uh, they were not made available to uh, the municipal offices. And were not considered it as a part of this application. Okay. Okay. So I, I just feel you've got to clear that part of it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Item number forty-five. Wait a minute. What happens if um, if our liquor license runs out on September 11th, and this issue isn't brought forward? Are we going to be without a liquor license? We obviously we can't we can't operate our business without our liquor license. Is that going to be? I just don't want there to be a, a time period where we're not going to have our liquor license where we haven't brought this before the board. Or that's why it's scheduled for September 10th. I was so in one night we can get it cleared. Is that? That would be. I I will speak for the council. Yeah. I'll let you speak for the council. I'm not. Sh what, what would if the council approved it that evening? Someone from your staff would have to make sure you've collected the, the approved form and take it to Augusta the next day uh, to uh, have the state grant for it. And how long would it take for the state? I mean, how long does that take? I was told it takes a few weeks, and that's why we're doing this now, so that they have the appropriate time to, to clear the license. If I may. We can, I can certify as a town clerk that this item will be on the agenda mm -hmm. September 10th. I have to forward that to the state. It's been done for the in a few years ago. Okay. That can be done, so that will give you the lead time that you'll need with the state okay. for whatever they, you know, so it will be carried over. Okay. That's right. All right. Thank, thank you, Debbie. Now on to number item 45 to consider approving Game of Chance licenses for the Proputa Club for September 8, 1990 and take any necessary action. Mrs. Pizzo, would you give us background, please? The council has before it uh, Games of Chance licenses requested from the Proputa Club. Uh, they, the Proputa Club will be holding a casino night on September 8. I have gone through the licenses and they are complete and ready for council action. And I would like to state that Mr. Larry Rieger, representing Paputa Club, was here earlier this evening 
but due to time conflicts had to leave so the co the um, club has been represented or was represented um, is there any council discussion on these game of chance applications this seems to be an annual affair if there is no real discussion I'd like to have a an all-inclusive motion made so we can vote on all of these at one time which would read blackjack one two three four poker one two chuck a luck high low and wheel of fortune I will so move your request second it <laughs> sounds good to me any further discussion if not all in favor seven zero item number 46 to consider a report from the family fund day committee and take any necessary action Hi, I'm Karen Dunphy, and this is Jan Love. We're co-chairs of Family Fun Day. This year, the newly appointed committee expanded the number of vendors, the entertainment, which lasted all day, included a new children's stage, broadened the scope of activities to include canine demonstration, karate demonstration, auction, um, lots of new things, and we dramatically increased the use of the fort. Um, the townspeople responded to our new logo and our wonderful publicity, and they came out in record numbers and supported all of our service organizations to record profits this year. Um, part of that deal with the townspeople for all their support is the fireworks. And as you all know, we had a lot of fog and we weren't able to have them. Um, it's, a, it's a big part of Family Fun Day, something that Cape residents are justifiably very proud of. And uh, we would like to ask that we reserve the 8th of September to hold the Family Fun Day fireworks for this year. I just have um, one short request that we also, um, with the success of this year's 1990 Family Fun Day, which we felt was overwhelmingly successful, and we do owe the town the fireworks and thank them for their support. And um, Jim Murray has everything in place to go with that we have no problems we stayed well within our budget we have uh, money in our budget available to fund the fireworks and all it is is a request for um, the fort for that date we can have them early in the evening kind of a get back to school celebration however we want to do it but we'd like to maintain that they are family fun day fireworks we'd also like to ask you if we can have June 15th 1991 for our next family fun day and so we can gather support and start working on that for next year if in fact you'd like to have Karen and I do that again I believe if you have to go through a formal request of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee for that date before it comes to us for approval mm -hmm. so you need to start that process now I think that okay, okay. Thank you. comments from counselors yes would you like to come forward please uh, Yes, and my name is Dick Walker, and I'm a member of the Fort Williams. Would you please come to the microphone <laughs> so people at home can hear you? I'm a member of the Fort Williams Advisory Com Commission. If you would put that letter, I think, to our chairman, Clint Blood, in writing, that's all that would be necessary with a date. Okay. We you. have a meeting in three weeks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Comments from the counselors? Councilor Amaro? Uh, how did it work with graduation uh, being right going quite late the night before it did not present a problem for us at all we were fine um, everybody was there waiting that needed to be there very few people set up the night before we only have one organization that chooses to and they were fine they had no problems they had more problems with fog than they did with graduation um, the next morning their tent was still there we had to wait for that to come down mm -hmm. but there it, were no it problems came down. there were no problems no substantial it was problems. fine in fact I think it all added to the festival atmosphere of the graduation and then the next day being family fun day and all the music and the entertainment I think it worked well together did you uh, consider uh, not doing the fireworks at all this year no we'd really prefer to do the fireworks we think that um, the town supported us overwhelmingly and it's something that the people of this town take great pride in. We have one of the best fireworks displays in the entire area and um, I think that we'd like to try and provide that for the people who supported us. 
Council McLaughlin. I want to commend you two for pulling off Family Fun Day this year, <laughs> having been in the beginning. I know the trials and tribulations you went through, and the entire town certainly takes its hat off to you. You did a superlative job. I need to know if we have to have any permission from the Fort Williams Advisory Committee to approve this request to the fireworks. The town council sets its, its own rules of procedure. Uh, you know, while they have not formally considered the state, you know, it has been cleared as far as uh, other scheduling problems, but the, the committee has not uh, formally considered it. That's not a, you know, an absolute requirement. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's our general procedure, though, is to have something like this approved by them. And that committee will meet again before September 8th, I assume. I would just, I'm ready to make a motion, but I would at some point like the formal endorsement of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. I don't. Usually, we're meeting on September 11th, but I don't think we need to give any approval. It was already given before, even though it's just a postponed event. Okay, uh, I'm I'm real comfortable with that, but I don't want to usurp anything. I therefore would like to make a motion, Madam Chairman, that um, we accept the verbal report we've had this evening from the Family Fund Day Committee co-chairs and approve the fireworks to be displayed in all their glory on September, Saturday, September 8th, 1990, at 7.30 p.m. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Discussion. What if the fog rolls in on September 8th? Right. Our, our fog date would be <coughs> the next night. The night? Which would be the night. Good. Councilor Jordan. I want to come in and it is, as I understand, to come in on the budget. <laughs> and I don't understand and I'm opposed to just picking a date and shooting off a bunch of fireworks just for the sake that you got the fireworks race less blowing up and without saving and saving money and using them every year, can they be saved until another year? I assume the fireworks themselves can be saved till another year. The um, problem that we face with that is m much of the funding for the fireworks comes from contributions that we um, work very hard to solicit. Um, we will have to return those contributions if we don't have 1990 fireworks. Um, I don't think it's necessarily an issue of saving the fireworks themselves. Everything's in place. Jimmy does it. Um, he owns them. He already has them and the, the bills are there to be paid. I just, I don't know why, I, I watch fireworks, kind of enjoy fireworks at times, but I think there's a lot of money going up in the air now pretty quick, and uh, I'm kind of opposed to just picking a date and to have some fireworks. If you had a fortune going with it, I don't know that I might agree with it, but as of now, I'm going to be opposed to it. Councilor Crillman. Well, <clears throat> no one's talking to me anyway at the end of tonight, so. <laughs> <laughs> to you to go on record here. Jan, you, you both done a super job. I mean, I was there both days, and I love fireworks, but uh, I echo Billy's concerns as finance uh, chairman of the town council. Um, the fireworks were budgeted at $5,500, and the overtime cost that would need to be paid would be another $2,000. That's $7,500 to celebrate September 8th, and... Uh, uh, the only thing I can think of is I'm out of town that weekend. <laughs> Maybe after tonight you'd want to celebrate. Uh, but I, I'm not going to be able to vote for it either. I, I just, I wish in some way it could be rolled over. I, I'm looking forward to just a horrendous uh, budget story this year. And if I see $7,500 quick, even though we tried real hard to get them off those two nights, it really is quite a distance from, from Family Fun Day. Uh, is this absolutely true that you have to return contributions? This is something new to me tonight. We do have to return the ones that were earmarked. We feel responsible to return the ones that were earmarked for fireworks. We get specific donations for fireworks for certain um, bursts, as they're called, and so forth, from organizations, and we do have to return that. Any, any ballpark figure of what of the 5,500 that would amount to? Um, probably 1,000 of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the $2,000 you used, you used for um, 
the overtown, overtime for the town is for the entire day, and that wouldn't come close to that for just the fireworks, but Mike would probably have a better idea about that. It's, it's getting up in that range uh, altogether. Just um, by the time you, you go in and, uh, you know, get, maybe we won't put as many signs up now, no parking right. signs, but uh, <laughs> uh, by the time you get, get up with the crew and get the parking organized and get the people in and get them out, uh, plus bring some folks in to clean up the next day if necessary, it, that's, it's probably on the high side, but it gets up, it gets up to about that. Councilor Reed. Uh, Madam Chairman, was that $2,000 figure if it had been on, on Labor Day or any day? No, see, the problem is when you, you do this on any evening, every last dollar is overtime cost. I see. That's, that's why it's so expensive. And it and would be the same Labor Day any Saturday or, or any evening. Councilor Amaro, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wondered if uh, the people who gave donations for the fireworks uh, were approached uh, and asked if they would be willing to allow that contribution to go toward next year's fireworks. I would think that most people would probably be willing to, to do that because that way they wouldn't have to be solicited next, next year. Uh, I guess I feel a lot like Bill and Wayne that it was unfortunate that the fog rolled in uh, during Family Fun Day weekend and I, I also feel it's just inappropriate to have a night of fireworks. Uh, and I'd really like to see us wait and do it next year at Family Fun Day. Councilor Jordan. I just like to ask the ladies, uh, you can approach these people that spend the donations on the room, so they want to do a no, no. So they're just assuming that they might want it back? I think we feel obligated to send back the money that was earmarked specifically for fireworks without, you now possibly we could ask them if they'd hold it over till next year. Yeah, but you haven't used the fireworks, so the donation is still there for those same fireworks. I agree with what Councilor Amro just said, that uh, I think those people should be approached, and I think they would earmark they, them and leave the money there for another year. They have a great track record for donating for fireworks, and I, but I can't speak for them. I mean. We would certainly ask them to consider it, but the decision would be theirs. Council McLaughlin. I would like to see us consider this as an extension of June's Family Fun Day. I, for me and for a lot of people who talk to me about it, Family Fun Day is one of the very good things that we do as a community and for the community as a whole. It really exudes a lot of good feelings. That was something that I think we're all aware that the town really needed in June after surviving the budget. We didn't get the t-shirts I survived the budget, but I think some people thought maybe those were warranted this year. I see this as getting us off to a good start this fall. We're going to show that we still have some really good feelings in this town and let's celebrate the fact that we're all going to be working together. That's why I don't care what day we have them on, but I think it's an appropriate way to continue the good feelings from Family Fun Day. I, I don't. I didn't want to create a punishment for you two to have to <laughs> solicit, resolicit people to, to uh, you know, to not uh, use the money that they had earmarked. Um, but I, I think there's another. I mean, I think you could put a, a one-liner in the Cape Courier if anyone who has donated to the Family Fund Day and earmarked money for fireworks would like it return, please contact so-and-so. That doesn't create an awful burden for you, and that's the last thing that I want to create is an extra burden after all the work you've put into this. But uh, again, and this is my last comment, but I still feel strongly about the um, holding over the 7500 I feel that fireworks are, are a sign of celebration and that it should be sort of the finale of a celebration. And that's what it usually is with Family Fun Day. But there has been so much time lapsed, I don't feel that it really would, would have the effect that you want to have everyone come just to see the fireworks. It would be wonderful if it could also be done in conjunction with something with our new Portland Headlight Keeper's Quarters opening. But um, I think now I'm going to move, move the question, move the motion. I just had one point I'd like to clarify. Here. So, sort of uh, penance on those staff. Uh, it's been said several times this evening that it was canceled both days because of fog. 
and uh, the second night was not at all foggy. And I would like to clarify that, uh, you know, in fact, the first we night was so foggy. We had so much fog that we yeah, this, the, the second night was forecast to come in when the decision was made. We couldn't see Cush, uh, Cushing Island, but uh, in fact, it was not foggy. So, uh, you know, I take responsibility if the fireworks are lost that uh, it, they perhaps could have been done the second night. But uh, one of those decisions that didn't work out right. We did all stand out there for good hour and watch, <laughs> watch Cushing disappear. <laughs> <laughs> At some points the headlight was completely obscured in fog and so we did make that decision but unfortunately it went the wrong way. <laughs> okay, I'll move the, move the question. All those in favor of having Family Fun Day fireworks on Saturday, September 8th? One, two. All those opposed? Five. The motion loses. Um, can we also find out, can we find out about our date for next year? Is this an appropriate time to ask you for June 15th of 1991, or would you prefer it? You, prefer, uh, you should go through the okay. Fort Williams Committee, and it will be brought back to us in time and fashion, I'm sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Item number 27, to consider a report from the Main Street 90 Committee regarding the publication of a pictorial history of Cape Elizabeth and take any necessary action. Dick Tinsman, who's the chairman of the committee, I believe has a statement or presentation. Uh, probably a presentation, but it shouldn't last more than five minutes or seven minutes, we hope. Some time ago, when you formed the Main Street 90 committee, it uh, got together and did a number of, uh, brainstormed a number of issues to find out what it perceived the town needed and wanted. One of the items that uh, was raised was a republication of a book called Collections of Cape Elizabeth, which were published originally in the mid-1960s um, by the town. There are a couple of those copies still remaining uh, in places like libraries and on people's shelves, but not a lot of them. Uh, it was a wonderful resource. The uh, the Main Street 90 Committee undertook uh, a program to find the author, Chris Reardon, finally found her, and uh, through a number of pieces of correspondence, uh, she developed a basis on which she would allow the book to be republished. The, in the interim uh, months, the Cape Elizabeth Historic Preservation Society developed a thought process to the point of bringing it to the Main Street 90 Committee, and that was in April, to develop a new book that uh, had took a different perspective than the collections of Cape Elizabeth. It was seen as an added, uh, an addition uh, to the collection of uh, Cape Elizabeth, um, and much more pictorially oriented, and as they brought that uh, concept to the Main Street 90 Committee, they had listened. Uh, in May, uh, Historic Preservation Society met uh, with our group and they presented to us a, um, a concept that uh, appeared to be well developed and uh, very exciting. Their first chapter was outlined and presented to us. Elizabeth Peterson is here this evening just to show you a little bit about uh, and talk a little bit about the organization. At our May meeting, we voted to recommend to the town council, uh, as my memo states to Mike McGovern, that the council philosophically support the development of a new book, uh, a historical book prepared by the Historical Preservation Society, uh, and that you consider the authorizing of an expenditure of money to help them get going to get the pictures uh, in place and the typesetting done so that uh, competitive bids can be received to uh, uh, pay for the book. The Historical Preservation Society and Bob Hannigan uh, from our committee took a couple of proposals when we were still talking about the collections of Cape Elizabeth and it appears as though the printing cost for a 100 page book would be somewhere on the order of 15000 to 17000 dollars. What I said in the memo is that we're looking for philosophical support and go ahead to the Historical Preservation Society for developing the uh, book to the point where it can be taken to competitive bid. 
um, and that uh, they need about $1,500 to um, get that book in its shape so that it can go to competitive bid. So that's what we're asking for tonight, the $1,500, uh, which will be used by the Historical Preservation Society to develop the book when it's properly formatted. It will be brought back to the Council for authorization to go ahead and solicit competitive bids and then printing if that's the then Council's desire to do. Uh, it's expected that the book will be ready in 1990, we hope. Um, it's getting short now. We tried to be on your agenda last month so that work could continue. Uh, and they're right now about a month uh, behind as we're waiting for that philosophical support and $1,500. So with that, uh, Elizabeth Peterson is here this evening. I'd like to have her just spend three or four minutes talking about the organization and what the Historical Preservation Society has done to this point in time. Betty? We knew it would be so crowded here in the parking facilities that we brought our props with us this morning. <laughs> I, I would like to introduce my committee, please. Jane Jordan, whom you all know, Miriam Chapman, Constance Murray, Marcina Berry, and our president, our new president, David Stack. I think Dick Tinsman has given you a very good background of what we have wanted to do and what we are in the process of doing. And we have been, if you, can you see these? All right. No, could you um, perhaps sort of just circle them by us? The one the council manager step no, why? Do you want to go down? And, okay. Perhaps you'd like to in a moment. We have done these as rough drafts of the first would you like me to continue? Yes. You do this? Oh. If we're not too distracting. No, no, this is fine. We have just done these as rough drafts of chapters one and two. I believe you all have an outline. I think Dick presented you with those. And what our proposition is for us to write the text and collect the pictures, for you people to publish it, and for the town of Cape Elizabeth to hold the copyright to it. I believe that has been a problem in the past, and we believe this is the way. It should be. We have proceeded with a great deal of research. We've collected a great many photographs, and we have many more which we can collect when we have the financial wherewithal to do it. Um, I think there's something magic about the name of William Jordan, because we have two very special William Jordans, and one is sitting here, and the other is, <laughs> where is he? He's not where here is tonight. <laughs> He's recuperating from an illness, and we're glad to hear that. He has offered graciously to act as our consultant, and we are certainly using him to uh, the utmost. We have been in contact with Earl Shettleworth, who is director of the Maine Historical Preservation in Augusta, and he has graciously offered to write a preface or an introduction to our book, which we're very thrilled about. He is also putting at our disposal a great many photographs, and I will say, if ever it comes to a vote as to helping the, I guess I should say, the state buildings in Augusta, we would recommend that we offer them money, all the money they need to air condition some buildings. <laughs> Connie and I spent two terribly hot hours in their main preservation building, and I feel sorry for them. He was glad we came on the day we did, because a week before he said we couldn't have stood it. But he will, they have funds in their department, so it would cost us nothing to have the many photographs that they will, will get for us. Um, Maine State Museum is being very helpful to us, and we don't know exactly what that will cost us, but um, Ed Churchill, if they have some marvelous materials that he's forwarding to us. Maine Historical Society has been extremely helpful, and they have pulled out everything that has anything to do with Cape Elizabeth and made their files available. Our own files are pretty full of wonderful things. Um, if you have questions, I think you can direct them to me or to any one of these people, or I will field them to them. Are uh, there questions you? from the counselors? Or comments? What, what? Councilor Amaro. 
Uh, what do you expect that the cost of this? I'm sure you'll have to wait. To well, we had hoped that it would not sell for over ten dollars. We'd like to keep it in that range. I think in talking with Mike McGovern and. I think that's the way we have felt pretty much. And with <coughs> Main Street 90, we'd like to keep it at a, in a price range that would be available. I think that's until we know exactly. We're aiming for 100 pages and approximately over 200 photographs, and that may go a little over that. It's hard for us to tell at this point. There are many photographs that would be contained in these chapters that, uh, that we do not have yet, that we certainly will anticipate having. Councillor Reed, the um, projections in item number five show uh, no profit until eight dollars and fifty cents per unit per book. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. pretty fair. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Councillor Jordan, these are taken as some of the pictures and the older pictures of Cape Elizabeth that you're going to put in the book. Uh, you're going to get a picture of some deer too, uh, a modernizer. <laughs> Well, we were thinking our hunting tonight is only for support and money. <laughs> we can manage that. I, I get your bow on What was the I think it's very good. And I'm all in favor of it, and I'm supported 100%. I still, I still have the one that was done in 1965. Have to bust it off once in a while to look at it, but uh, it's still around the house, and it's a great. And uh, I know some history of that book being put together, I was involved a little bit, but I will not state it publicly because it may get too personal. <laughs> well, I think we've all enjoyed that book, but we felt the time had come for, a, we felt it was almost a mandate for us as a historical preservation society with all the material we have available to bring out a new book. And we certainly appreciate the support of Main Street 90, and we hope you'll feel exactly the same way. Am I correct that there will be no advertising in this book? There will be no advertising, and as far as possible, we will not use any of the same pictures. They are now in public domain. We would be able to if we chose, but we don't think we're going to need to. The, in Chapter 1, there is a map, Captain John Smith's map, and it's the only one available, and many of these things come from Maine Historical Society. So we'll try not to duplicate anything that has been in the previous book. Council McLaughlin. Elizabeth, you've done your usual fine job tonight, oh, and I commend you and your you. group. One question that I expect to have to answer, and I need your help on it, is what is the connection between your group and the town's Board of Historic Preservation Advisors? Is that the right? I think Mike can answer that. Is that the right name? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let him sit for long. That's what I get for trying to stretch. Uh, there are two independent bodies. Uh, the Board of Historic Preservation Advisors is a town council appointed committee of seven. The Cape Elizabeth Preservation Society is a voluntary group interested in uh, pr preservation in the community and with a particular emphasis in the past on records preservation. And probably another question, maybe Elizabeth can answer this. Is there any joint effort between the two bodies for um, undertaking this project well, of the book? There has not been. Okay. We would welcome suggestions. I thought the question you were going to ask whether there was any connection between us and the South Portland. And the, we are a working research group. That's the difference. I'm not sure just what they do. They, they certainly have some interesting material and artifacts. Um, yes. Connie Murray, Hi, where are I? right there, um, was the one who really organize this group and she deserves a great deal of credit. And Connie, you might like to say something about our procedures. The relationship between the two. You have to go to the microphone. You have to go to the yes. mic, Connie. <laughs> You've been the, the head of the class for going on a step right up there. <laughs> there was a relationship when I was president of the Board of Historic Preservation and the society, and so both were started in a sense with Mike and me, and then I started the society. And now Jane, who is a member, Jane Jordan, who's a member of our historic preservation group society, is also chairman of the board, so there certainly should be some coordination. I think, I thank you, Connie, for that explanation. I think that's always something that the town likes to see the town 
appointed committees involved in this kind of activity. I was just trying to see if that was happening. I imagine I it will. I would like to give Jane Jordan a lot of credit. She is doing all our typesetting for us. That isn't the exact word. She's doing all our typing for us, and this is going to help us immeasurably when we get ready to go to press. We would have had two more quotes tonight, but they weren't presented to us, and our hope is that we will have nothing to do with the financial part other than receiving money. We have other things on our mind. If there are no other questions or comments of um, Elizabeth, I would like a motion on this item. I have a question, Madam Chairman. Okay. <laughs> I'm hearing them make a request for us to philosophically approve this, also for us to approve $1,500. I'd like to know what account that money would be proposed to come from. I believe it would come from the undesignated surplus. I do have a, a concern, though, uh, in that you know, fifteen hundred dollars is is really an obligation to go ahead. Mm -hmm. And you know, I would prefer that you you get it out of the way, appropriate the dollars necessary, subject to a condition, perhaps that you look at it before it's actually published. But the uh, the concern is, you know, like so many other projects, I think the council needs to face up front what the true cost of it is rather than get nickel and dimed along the way. And I would suggest that, that you look at it in, in terms of its total cost and uh, head in that direction. If we're looking at an upset limit of seventeen to $18,000, which part of the budget would that come from? It, what would happen, it would be, it would come from undesignated surplus, but it would also be set up as an enterprise fund, uh, whereas the proceeds of it would go, uh, directly back into the, f into the fund. So what you, you'd have is a continuing asset in, in terms of the work in progress and uh, you know, a liability in terms of the cost, and, but in the end, uh, it would hopefully break even and you know, be a successful enterprise. Thank you. Madam Chairman. I just had one question as far as the funding. Uh, once again, when we make a commitment to fund a project like this, is it possible in order to defray these costs uh, to perhaps solicit advance orders for a prospective book, and if it did not turn out to be, then that would be refunded. Or, uh, I know that it's no advertising, but is it inappropriate for a book of this nature to have corporate sponsors or personal sponsors uh, that says the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society would like to uh, thank the following persons for their generous support in making this book possible and available for you, you know, just as a, as a thought of alternative funding. I mean, just to out Charlie or say, okay, let's, here's the funds, here's the, you know, just to drum up that kind of interest. All those types of things are done. I, I would hope that the council might look at it in, in the context of other fundraising that has recently occurred and will be occurring uh, in the community. As far as the advertising, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a judgment of the Preservation Society. Uh, that is their judgment if, if the council, you know, wishes to go along with that. Uh, you know, the council can. If, if you don't go along with that, you know, I think you'd be giving the message by giving a smaller amount of dollars, uh, making a smaller number of dollars available. Mr. McGovern, if, oh, go ahead. Would it be I, I don't know of any grants available. Uh, you know, th there may be, you, I think usually what happens is in terms of uh, community histories is, is the legislature appropriates X number of dollars to buy so many to give them to libraries. Uh, that's what's traditionally been done uh, over history. Uh, but you know, that, that usually takes a, a special act of the legislature. Mr. McGovern, if there were non-solicited voluntary contributions wanting to be made to this book and having their name included on a special thank you page, would they be allowed to accept them? You know, if the, the group working on the book has no objection, you know, to, but not to actively a soliciting. benefactor page. Uh, but not soliciting. That's, you know, that, that's judgments up to the council whether or not you want to solicit <coughs> Councilor Jordan. 
I would, <coughs> would like to see us move forward and let them know that the money's available. I'm not in favor of putting any advertising or any uh, page in there as far as people that make contributions. I feel that if we could come up with the money and look into the possibility of a grant and also as the money come back for the sale of the book to reduce the cost that was put in up front, I feel that's the way I'd like to see it go. Are you willing to make a motion? I'll make a motion to that effect if the clerk understands my motion. And that also includes a written agreement providing That's the right. town with the copyright. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Oh. Councilor Amaro. I guess I'm not clear on the motion. Is it to fund the total cost? Or is it for the fifteen hundred dollars to get started? Oh, I'm sorry. I I wrote down seventeen thousand. Yeah, that's for the total cost. Uh, that's what I seconded. I assumed it was seventeen thousand dollars. Any other discussion, Councillor McLaughlin? I'd like us to consider reviewing the draft of this before it goes to publication, before that amount of money is expended. I don't know if you want to add that to the motion or if we can have a verbal agreement on that. I, d I don't feel it needs to be in the motion. I would think the people that are putting the book together would let the council see a draft of it before it went to <laughs> <laughs> If not, we'll file them yeah. quick. <laughs> <laughs> I just got my verbal agreement. Further, further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? That's a 7 0. Your work is on its way, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is to consider recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission regarding requests from the South Portland Rotary Club and from the Maine Army National Guard to utilize Fort Williams Park on September 30th and October 13th, 1990, respectively, and take any necessary action. I believe Mr. Dick Walker from the Fort Williams Advisory Committee is here to give us some background. Partially. The first question I am prepared to answer, the second one I have probably not nearly as much knowledge as Mike does, I guess, so. <laughs> um, as far as the uh, South Portland Cape Elizabeth Rotary is concerned. Uh, they had a representative, Doug Stewart, that met with our committee on the 19th of June, asking for the use of Fort Williams uh, in part on Sunday, September 30th. They are having a regional fellowship uh, meeting that weekend of not only their rotaries, but other rotaries in, I think, uh, Maine and part of New Hampshire, which is a new idea, and on their last day, they wanted to have a softball tournament and a cookout at Fort Williams. They anticipate that they would have 250 to 400 people. However, they had no real body count since this was a first-time event. And uh, they are supposed to return with uh, more specific figures on their population sometime during this month of August. Uh, and also more detailed plans, which those figures would indicate the uh, need for. They would use the picnic area and uh, have a tent erected adjacent to that for their cookout, and then they would use the ball field at the parade grounds for their softball tournament. They are prepared to use buses to access the fort if they have a large number of people in place of automobiles so that they would not impact the use of the fort by the normal uh, flow of people there. If they um, uh, have uh, so many people that they would need extra support as far as sanitary facilities are concerned, they're prepared to meet that cost and handle it themselves. They also would do their own uh, policing and trash collection and uh, they would not need the cooperation of the public works uh, support. 
we voted unanimously to allow them to use the fort uh, subject to the town manager and town council approval and I think our rationalization was uh, based on several points this seemed like an appropriate time for them to do this and they were an organization that was a nonprofit service organization which is the type that we feel Fort Williams should be prepared to extend itself to. Rotarians also have an ex exemplary reputation for doing what they say they will do. The fourth thing, and I think the most important thing as far as our commission was concerned, is that the South Portland and Cape Rotary uh, has done a tremendous job in being a friend to Fort Williams, and I have no idea how familiar all of you present counselors are to that fact. They, for instance, showed up on uh, clean-up days with coffee and donuts. They contributed half the cost of the new flagpole, which was $3,500. They made a sizable contribution to the picnic shelter, and they've always been the good citizen. So that was the reason for our unanimous vote. Thank you. I'll field any questions, although I think they're all the answers I have. <laughs> is, is, do you feel that uh, Mr. McGovern would be the one to give background on the National Guard use? Is that what you said? Um, we approved that. Uh, I think we approved it in principle, but not in detail, Mike, at the last meeting, right? The thing that uh, I think the reason that will be approved is that uh, they are going to have a parade on the parade grounds of 600 uh, National Guardsmen, and they are changing that, their present name, which I unfortunately do not know, to the main 20th Regiment, which was the famous regiment at the Battle of Little Round Top during the Battle of Gettysburg. So uh, it would be quite an event, I think, for the whole town and quite an honor to have them there. Do you have anything to add to that, Mike? Any comments from counselors? Councilor George? Just one, one comment. As far as uh, the National Guards and that day there, is that going to be open to the public so the public can go in and see Yes, this? it is. They yes. come? Yeah. Be room for everybody to actually review that? I can see quite a number of people want to see that operation. It is open to the public. Uh, they will have, I think, they have 600 personnel of their own that will be doing the ceremony. Should be quite a show. And who will be supervising the parking of the onlookers? Um, that is your concern, isn't it, Councilor Jordan? That the spectators may create a large problem? Well, if they're going to have 600 people there, there's a possibility that the wives and sons and daughters and what have you, or the majority of them, I would think, would want to be there plus the public, and if they're going to use a playground, I just wonder where everybody's going to get a chance to view it in the park due to the location of it. Now, maybe it'll work, I don't know. Um, you want me to answer, try to answer? Go that? ahead. <laughs> uh, I think they would be able to, uh, the 600 people that are going to, the militia, I call them, that are going to be participating in this ceremony will be on the flat part of the parade ground, which is the baseball part. And I think that the attending public in great numbers could view that from our renovated bleachers, <coughs> uh, which we hope to have completed by that time, and from the other hill on the other side of the field, which is sort of a natural viewing area, you know, past the, just before you go up to Officer's Rail. Okay. Just pointing that out, if, and I still feel that it's going to be a quite a crowd in a small area. Is there a motion on this proposal? Council McLaughlin? Madam Chairman, I have a question <laughs> again. What parking arrangements do you foresee for the day the National Guard is there? I, I know nothing about that. Mike, you have to help me out on that. I don't know what uh, Bob O'Malley has discussed with you. Could, uh, I'd like to have this one thing nailed down, which is the thing I came prepared to talk about. Tonight. The rotary. And finish those questions first before we get involved. Okay, I'm asking that because we have this as one this item on one the item. agenda. And I don't have any problem with approving both parts of it, but I, I want to know what kind of thoughts gone into the parking. I see. I, I don't have that as a yeah. second item. 
We, we get a new one. The, I yet to speak to the National Guard. Uh, they did speak with Clint Blood, the chairman of the committee, over with Randall Weil, a member of the committee. Right. Uh, but the problem is they're now all over the state doing their community service projects. Uh, a place where we hope to see them a year from now, uh, a little bit closer, we'll know where to track them down. But uh, trying to get answers out of uh, from them, and in fact, late this afternoon, I did get the number of where they're actually in camp. And, but I, late this afternoon, I couldn't get a hold of uh, Major Gilbert, the, the one that's in charge. My hope is, and what the, what the plan would be, is, uh, you know, they're a big outfit, and uh, is that they would provide the parking services and those other ancillary service. I, I do anticipate we would have a, a couple of public works people, uh, Rangers, um, Bruce Kenton, and uh, we will incur some overtime cost. Whether or not the May National, Army National Guard is equipped to pick, pick that up, I don't know. I will have that discussion with them, and if they're not, uh, it would be a town contribution. I, I have one thing I just thought of, Mike, I'd like to add, and that's the political aspect of this. Uh, we are talking our commission with the National Guard to see uh, what performance capabilities they are be going to be able to give us for plans that we will pre be presenting to you shortly as far as a long-range plan for the fort. And uh, they, those uh, have been meaningful discussions and they are anxious to have training programs in a couple areas where we really feel we could get real tax dollar savings by having them perform. So we would like to be very friendly with them. So you want to say yes right quick? <laughs> That's really it, yeah, yes. That yeah, comes down to that. I believe um, there's also someone else who might like to make a, a quick comment about the um, rotary um, happening. Uh, Mr. Bob Lavassa, do you? I'm just here to answer questions. Are there any questions that we can ask directly of Mr. Lavassa in reference to the rotary uh, weekend? It was well presented, Mr. Lavassa. <laughs> <laughs> Are there uh, any other questions to the councilors? If not, I'd like to count the Amaro. Yeah, uh, I'll, I move that uh, the date of September 13th uh, be set aside uh, for use of the Ford by. Mm -hmm. Oh, 30? I don't have my glasses. <laughs> 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 September 30th, please support by the uh, South Pole and Cape Elizabeth Rotary uh, Club. And <laughs> October 13th, I knew there was a 13th someplace, uh, for the uh, National Guard uh, operation. I will second that, especially knowing the reputation the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Rotary has in softball tournaments. We expect to see another trophy. Yeah, right. <laughs> I okay. think it's such an appropriate use of the fort to have the uh, the renaming done right yeah. there for mm -hmm. That's That'd funny. be fabulous. <coughs> yeah. We um, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of this motion, seven zero. Congratulations, gentlemen. Both functions will be held. And Thank you very much. <coughs> Item number forty nine to consider a report from the ordinance committee relating to the bicycle ordinance and take any necessary action. Council McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chairman. At its last meeting, the Ordinance Committee considered this report, this ordinance, excuse me, and our report is that we would like to be able to set this to a public hearing next month with the committee's recommendation that we can discontinue this ordinance. I don't think we can ever get as far as saying for every new ordinance we create we'll discontinue an existing one, but we did find that in looking this over that the desirable policies regarding bikes do not need to be in ordinance form. These are policies regarding voluntary registration, a safety program conducted by our police department, and if necessary, the posting of ways for bicycles will travel. And it will be our recommendation after a public hearing, I imagine, that we direct through the manager, direct the police department to carry out these actions as policies rather than an ordinance form, which is an awkward ordinance at best to enforce. Councilor Emma. Uh, I just wondered about some parts of the ordinance, though, that uh, prohibit uh, bicycle riders from riding abreast, et cetera, and some of the other state traffic, reference to state traffic laws, et cetera. Uh, those seem to be valuable uh, for enforcement purposes. I don't know if state law 
actually prohibits riding abreast on bicycles, but that's a real problem in this town. Uh, and I'd hate to see us eliminate that if it isn't a state law. I don't know if that particular section now, of is covered in state law or not. If not, we could certainly have a very abbreviated bicycle ordinance. I think the problem we're encountering right now is this just isn't enforced. Councilor Jordan. I, as a member of the Ordinance Committee, uh, voted in favor of setting this to a public hearing. But I have reservations of, and have been thinking of it afterwards of doing away with the whole ordinance. And I come, want to come up with uh, Senator and the Council Amaro just because I got so frustrated the other day with people riding to a breast and I had to slow down, practically stop to let the car go by when I felt I had the road and, and they ignore the traffic. So I think it's something that's going to come down the line here in a few years that you're going to have to have some regulations due to this so many bikers around. And uh, in fact, on 77, uh, only a couple of weeks ago, they were riding in the travel way with that nice wide uh, bike way, so I think before we junk it all together, we should give it some thought and use an agreement to set it to a public hearing and see what some of the people have to say about it. But I'm not in favor at this point to junk it. Councilor Pearson. Uh, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman. Uh, I agree with, let's say, dumping the first 14-1-1 through 14-1-7 about the licensing. But the writing of breasts, posting ways, et cetera, if they are not already stated in the state laws uh, regarding uh, roadways and bicycles and use thereon, then I think that they should be kept in the local audience. But I was always brought up from day one when I had a bicycle that you maintain the same rules of the road on a bicycle as you do on a car. And, you know, if they aren't state law, then I think we should definitely keep those in the ordinance. Okay, we can, we can discuss that at, at the public I hearing. I think if we have the police chief at the public hearing ready to address those concerns, that will help all of us. So is there a motion to post this for public hearing? So moved. Second. Um, 7.30 p.m. to <laughs> September 10th, 1990. You didn't disappoint me. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of setting this for public hearing? 7-0. Item number 50. <clears throat> to consider a report from the Appointments Committee regarding vacancies on town boards and commissions and take any necessary action. Uh, Councillor Amaro is chairman of the Appointments Committee. I want to borrow my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I think my arms are just about long enough. <laughs> it's okay. uh, we have uh, three, three positions that we uh, are ready to recommend uh, applicants for for you tonight. And all three are outstanding, I think, appointments. Uh, the first is uh, for an associate to, to position on the planning board, and it's to fill a position uh, caused by a resignation. Uh, and the person that we are recommending for that associate position is Judy Lardner. She's a former planner uh, in South Portland. Uh, she has two small children and is presently uh, staying at home to raise those children. Is very anxious to do some public service. Has an outstanding background uh, and. All three of us were highly impressed when we interviewed her, uh, uh, and so I pass on that recommendation. I don't know if you want to maybe handle these one at a time. Okay, the, uh, the second position uh, that we need to fill was caused because uh, one of our new counselors had to vacate the Board of Sewer Appeals. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have Scott Clark, who is a scientist with the IDEX Corporation. Uh, willing and very willing and anxious to serve on the Board of Sewer Appeals, and uh, that will be for a term uh, of almost two years. His term would expire March 1st, 1992. And uh, we also have a recommendation for uh, uh, a position on the Arts Commission, which was also, is also the result of a resignation. Uh, and this uh, position, uh, we are, for this position, we are recommending Claudia Finkelstein, uh, who is a psychological examiner. Uh, 
and uh, who has a strong interest in the arts and is very excited about being asked to serve on this uh, commission. We're very excited to recommend her and to recommend all three of these candidates. Uh, and with that, I'll make that a formal motion. Second it. Council McLaughlin. Madam Chairman, as, the as a current planner in the city of South Portland, I request that I be allowed to abstain from this vote um, for the possible um, appearance of a bias. Other comments from other councillors? Any discussion? I guess I just wanted to um, just ask the, I guess the committee, um, with with the possibility of our funding a full-time planner, is having another professional planner on the planning board perhaps going to be a hindrance in that we're trying to delegate more power and decision making as far as completeness of applications to the staff person? Is this, I'm just, it's that, a theoretical. That was, yeah, no, that's a good question because it's a question that we all ask <laughs> and that we uh, spend a lot of time discussing. Uh, uh, with Judy, and uh, she seemed to have, be very responsive to the fact that uh, uh, what the position of the professional planner is and what the, what, what the role of the uh, board member is. Uh, and she's, I mean, I, I'd like to hear responses from the other committee members, but <coughs> we felt very uh, confident that she would be an excellent board member. She, she clearly had uh, the delineation of duties and responsibilities um, better than um, I had expected. Or, I mean, she just rolled them right off, so I, I was very uh, comfortable. I, I concur, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, all of us came up with a, our own list of questions and answers, and that was one of the ones that was asterisk, uh, highlighted and starred. Uh, would she feel any conflict or uncomfortable working with a full-time planner and she took her position as the lay position and representing a lay board and was very comfortable with that. Good. I yet, think that the, uh, the council ought to know that we do have two other people serving on the planning board who have professional planning board background at this point. Any other comments from other councilors? If not, all those in favor of accepting the recommendations of the Appointments Committee? That would be a 6-0 and one abstention. The next item on the agenda is to consider a recommendation of a town manager to establish the town plan of position as a full-time position and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, would you give us some? Council previously discussed this in a workshop, and since you're familiar with the issue and due to the lateness of the hour, I will summarize uh, the whole issue by saying I believe that a full-time planner would greatly as uh, assist with the existing needs of the planning board, would do a tremendous job in helping to, uh, in to implement the comprehensive plan. Uh, the position funding is quite tight, but I believe it can be done with existing uh, available funds in both planning board and the administration uh, accounts and the job description is, is already prepared and I would hope that the council would approve this. I would look forward to advertising for the position uh, in New England publications uh, beginning next Sunday. Comments? Councilors? Councilor Jordan. I have, I have a comment. The only comment I have is I'm in favor of the planner, but the interviewing process and the person that we get, I'm not ready to hire somebody that is going to be a figurehead or a pencil pusher or a paper shuffler because I feel that's going to be a waste of money now. Whether there's some other way in the interviewing process that we, somebody might come in and help with us if you thought it was necessary to get somebody, and I think we need a strong person, and that is about the only way that I would go along with it. But I am going along with it at this point, and just want to make those comments that we do our best. If we don't like the applications the first time around, we go back again. And maybe we haven't got money enough to get the type of person that I feel we should have, but I, I feel it should be looked at. Other comments? 
Council McLaughlin. We went through this process almost two years ago, and we had a search committee at that time doing the interviewing, screening, screening the applicants, doing the interviewing. That kind of procedure has not been recommended this time, and I'm very comfortable with the manager undertaking that responsibility. I think he has a good reading of what the council is looking for for qualities in a plan, or some of which Council Jordan has just enumerated. And I'm feeling better than I probably was about this six or seven months ago. And I think we, I'm hoping fairly confidently we will have some very worthy candidates apply for this position. Other comments? I, I would just like to say that one of the reasons my thinking has turned around on this particular issue is that we as a town council have a major goal of trying to implement as much of the comprehensive plan as, as feasible. And so much of it um, involves writing of ordinances and coordinate, coordinating of ordinances that I feel that we can justify the other half of a planner, provided this person does spend about that amount of time, 50 percent of the time or so, helping the drafting of new ordinances and the implementation of the plan. Therefore, I'd like a motion on this item, please. Councilor Reed. Um, Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the town manager to utilize existing budget resources to employ uh, a full-time plan. Second. Sure. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? 7-0 vote. Item number 53. <clears throat> Number 52, excuse me. Um, to consider signing the 1990-1991 Local Road Assistance Program certification and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, would you give us a bit more background? Every year, the Maine Department of Transportation sends us a letter in early July stating that we're supposed to pass the certification by July 1st. Uh, it <laughs> once again. Uh, what, what we are expected to receive $62,724. I believe the amount in the, in the budget was $60,000. And these monies are uh, used as a revenue uh, to reduce taxes. But also, I think more importantly, uh, is that it can be shown that the budget process, uh, we spend far more than this uh, in road improvements. And that is, in fact, you know, ultimately uh, where, where it does go. The town uh, can clearly show that it expends uh, beyond this amount uh, for road improvements. And if you put on Spurlink Avenue today, uh, you can see some uh, town-funded road improvements ongoing. If you've been on the Route 77 strip, uh, it's about $25,000 uh, for the town-funded improvements there, about $175,000. So I would ask you to authorize uh, yourselves to sign this. Councilor Amaro. Just one question. Uh, with that new program of $1,200 per mile. Are we going to do better? We have benefited slightly. Uh, our amount had dropped down to about 50000 and now it's back up. You can see that about 62 cents. Thank you. Is there a motion on this item? I'd move that we uh, authorize the town manager to sign the grant uh, assessment with the Department of Economic and Community Development. I'm sorry, for, I'm sorry, to consider signing the Local Road Assistance Program certification. Is there a second? Second. For the um, Mr. McGovern? I, I believe the municipal yeah. offices have to sign that, not, not the manager. Okay. That is so correct. amended. So amended. That is correct. All those in favor? 7 0. Item number 53. To consider authorizing the town manager to sign an agreement with the Department of Economic and Community Development for a $2,600 grant from the Municipal League Defense Fund and take any necessary action. Someone. Mr. McGovern? Second. <laughs> <Someone. Someone. laughs> Is there any discussion? There being no discussion, all those in favor? 7 0. Item number 54. I believe, whoop, I think we got one or two minutes. Show me that quick. I'll take a motion for extending the town council rules in order to complete our set agenda. For this so evening. moved. Second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor? On to a number 54. 
to consider a request from the Animal Refuge League for $4,500 and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? The Animal Refuge League sent us a letter July 16, 1990, uh, requesting uh, $4,500 <coughs> for support. Well, you know, I think the Animal Refuge League does a, provides a lot of important services. I was quite concerned with, with the approach in this letter, in, in, partic in particular with its timing and its tone. Uh, I, to, to be quite frank, and since there aren't too many people there, I, all I could think was the word extortion uh, when I read this letter. And that's, that's a little strong, but that, that was my thought. And uh, I realized that. And uh, I, I think this does need some further discussion and some further review. Uh, we looked at how many dogs the town itself brought over there, and it was around 50 a year. Uh, and at, at this cost, it would be about $90 per animal. The Animal Refuge League does have uh, quite a bit of available resources in terms of an endowment. Uh, and uh, you know, while, again, I, I think they do fine work, I think before I would recommend the town giving them $4,500. I, I would suggest that the Finance Committee, and particularly its chairman, uh, work with me to develop more data uh, for the council so that you can uh, better consider this request. Comments? I would um, just comment that our finance committee chair just can't seem to stay away from the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I have a conflict of interest. <laughs> I think the dogs are pretty. Okay, I'll take a motion on this item, please. Oh, Madam Chairman, could I have some clarification first? Do we know of any other arrangements that might be available rather than going to the Animal Refuge League? The chief of police has been looking into some. Uh, at, at, as of this point, they're inconclusive. And Part of the work that I think the Finance Committee Chair would do uh, would be to work with me and the Chief of Police to see what options might be available. And I think that might be done in light of looking into those options in conjunction with um, bordering mun municipalities. Councillor Reed. Uh, just a piece of information. Uh, as of today, we have approximately 600 licensed dogs in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And I think we have less than 9,000 residents, as stated in the letter. Oh, we definitely do. Yes, that was an error. Councilor Jordan. I just want to say that I'm in agreement with the manager. I think the, this letter indicates you either give us $4,500 or else type attitude when I read it. But unless you come up with some other option that I haven't been able to think of unless Council Creamer is going to send a dog kennel or something to that effect to make it handier. I think you'd better look at this pretty carefully because they're a pretty handy place and there is other places but they're a little farther away than the one in Westbrook. And whether they take them in and you care for them and treat them the same as they do out there. I think they get their bucks and I don't know what has happened and maybe you'll find that out. In the past, they've done it for free for a good number of years, and all of a sudden they need some bucks, and something has happened along the line because I've been out there before and with dogs, and they've been very, you know, agreeable. So don't, don't get them upset until you have a good chat with them. In one of these letters, I guess it's had some reference to the fact that Portland had closed its pound and um, needed facilities too. Well, why um, shall we authorize then the manager and the finance committee chairman to investigate this item and bring it back to us, hopefully, next month? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Would you prefer? Hopefully next month. Hopefully next month. It's not binding. It's not binding. No. <laughs> All those in favor? 7-0. Um, item number 55. To consider authorizing the expenditure of an amount not to exceed $5,000 from the Thomas Jordan account for costs associated with obtaining an appraisal for the poor farm property and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, uh, as a result of uh, the work of the Thomas Jordan Committee and further research by the, the town attorney, it's become apparent that before the Thomas Jordan issue moves forward anymore, that, that the town ought to have a pretty good handle on, excuse me, what uh, the land is actually worth. Uh, working, uh, the council chairman and myself had a meeting with the town attorney about two months ago now, maybe not quite two months ago, and decided that uh, we ought to start soliciting proposals from uh, appraisers to have an appraisal done. 
Uh, that process has been ongoing. One has been received. Uh, we expect to receive uh, at least one additional proposal and hopefully two more within the next week to two. Uh, we would like to uh, use this opportunity to move forward on this and uh, I would uh, recommend that you appropriate an amount uh, not to exceed $5,000 uh, from the <coughs> core farm rental slash Thomas Jordan account. Councilor Kerman. Um, given the amount of information we have already, um, it just sounds, $5,000 sounds like an awful lot of money to, to kind of make a bottom line statement given the reams of documents that uh, our town attorney has. Is it a absolutely bona fide, necessary expense beyond what has happened. I, I believe so. We have reams of documents, but we don't we don't have what I think is probably the most necessary document, which is which is the appraisal. Uh, if if the council goes forward with its earlier plan or with desires to even consider it, what you'd be doing is is going to uh, a court of competent jurisdiction. I think the Thomas Jordan report read to get authorization uh, to work out a new trust arrangement whereby. The, the suggestion had been the town would buy the property uh, and then the proceeds would be utilized uh, to help out the poor. In order to figure out exactly what you want to buy the property for, you really need an independent review of that uh, in order to have the court of competent jurisdiction uh, uh, rely on uh, the evidence. Mr. Wakeland's research could not be uh part of that process. As, as, a, as nice a guy he, as he is, and as, uh, as competent an attorney as he is, he, he does not have the certified review appraiser uh, designation after his name. And that's what the court will be looking for. And this is something that's been recommended by both our town attorney and Mr. Um, Wakeland as well. Council McLaughlin. I'm wondering what other expenditures, if any, would be expected from the existing Thomas Jordan account in next year? Uh, as of this point, none, unless the, the council specifically authorized some expenditure from it. Uh, you know, the, the legal fees up to this point have been borne by the general fund. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, there is a possibility at some point that you may want to look at those and charge them off to the, to the Thomas Jordan fund, but it's not something that has to be decided tonight. But the, the main expense is the, uh, the appraisal. Appraisal. Thank you. Mr. Councilor Jordan. I yield to Councilor Pearson, I believe, his hand is up. Uh, question, uh, Madam Chairwoman. And I don't know if this makes sense, or, but the question unanswered is the foolish one, right? Whatever. Uh, this appraisal of current market value, right, for which the town might purchase it. Has it been thought maybe to the retroactive value of the land when it was first deeded at simple interest over 100 years versus the actual market value? Because <coughs> I don't know if they equal out, but I think it's kind of awkward to say that this was deeded 100 plus years ago. Now we're going to take it at full market value. If it was only a dollar an acre back then, that's $100. I don't think simple interest over 100 years is going to equal to current market value. And I think that's unfair to the taxpayers. Council McGovern. Mr. McGovern. It is going to be next week. The, the opinion of the town attorney, the opinion of David Wakeman, who is an attorney, who's chairman of the committee, as well as the recommendation of the Thomas Jordan Trust Study Committee, uh, have all been, has all been, have all been, that the town ought to look at the property with its current market value. They, they believe it's only fair to the poor of the community and that, that beyond that, that it ought to be looked at as if, I think the other the major issue there, as if the refuse disposal area had never been there, uh, which is, uh, you know, because that has a negative net worth. And the feeling of the committee and the attorneys was that uh, uh, that ought not to be a, a charge off against the trust since it, it was there by sufferance of the trust and not uh, in any way uh, had by the same token, though, the original price of that land had a dollar an acre, and then if we decide that the transfer station was used 20 years ago at a set fee compounded with the 
funds that were already gaining interest. I don't know what the logistics are, but it just, you know, maybe the numbers won't work. Maybe we still have to go with the appraisal anyways and see which one is more beneficial and fair to the town as a whole. I guess we have to, we have, to have a professional appraisal based on present market value or close to it um, in order to go before any kind of a court. And a lot of it is wetland, too. So which there again. Wasn't, which wasn't 100 years ago. So and it some, actually some had market value. Was, too. So, you know, okay. that it's, it's a step that's been recommended very strongly by the town attorney and that committee. And um, it's been almost 18 months in getting to this stage. Okay. Councilor Jordan. I'm just interested and amazing to me here two months ago or three months ago we had to come up with some bucks to find out where the boundaries were. Now we're going to have an appraisal where they don't know where the boundaries <coughs> are. I offered to show you three boundaries but you wouldn't believe me after they are done. And nobody took me up on it so evidently they are going to appraise it on what is their open and I hope they know which side of the fence it's supposed to be on. There is a lot, of, there is a lot, and I hope that they have researched this that was given to the town back in the, I'm going to say the late 50s maybe, right by the Spank River, below the, where the uh, new treatment plant is. And I don't know whether anybody ever went back in the town reports to find that or not, but I hope they don't include that into the uh, appraisal. And I think these things should be looked into before we go too far ahead. I'm in favor of the appraisal figure and, uh, and have it done so we can move forward one way or the other what we're going to do with it. But I think there's some unanswered questions that we, needs to be looked at before they go too far and know where they are. And also they don't own all the Spark Marsh. Tell them that before the appraisal. On, on the issue of the Sprague property adjacent to the river, uh, that the attorneys have done the work on that. Uh, they're aware of how it was acquired, and they have mapped it out on the map that they're giving to the appraisers. Uh, as to the exact boundaries of the, the marsh, uh, thousands of dollars worth of legal research uh, has, has shown that there's no conclusive evidence exactly where the boundary is. Uh, there's, uh, there's a certain war of, of where it is, and uh, in part, that's that's what it's going forward on. Uh, is uh, you know the current census maps and uh, any exceptions that they're able to find to that. But essentially, it's it's going to be uh, about what is shown on the census maps with the with the separating out of the spread property. Other comments? If not, I'll take a motion on this item, Madam Chairman. Councilor McLaughlin. I move that we authorize the manager to expend an amount not to exceed $5,000 from the Thomas Jordan account for costs associated with obtaining an appraisal for the poor farm property. Is there a second? Second. second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. I'd like to ask that we take one item out of order, which would be um, citizens discussion of items not on the agenda um, since the final item is to go into executive session so are there any citizens present who wish to make a statement on items not on the agenda if not um, on to item number 56 to consider entering into executive session to discuss and decide upon a request for a hardship tax abatement and to discuss negotiations involving the acquisition of property rights and take any necessary action. So moved. So a second. And I'd like to thank our veteran um, camera crew for staying this late hour. And I think that perhaps you can call it an evening. And good night to you all. Good luck. Good luck in the year.